Okay, welcome back to my series on classical German philosophy and German idealism. I have a very special guest today. Um, I have uh, Dr. Benedict Paul Goethe, um, who is a German philosopher and theologian. He's a university professor at the um, philosophy of religion and philosophy of the science um, at the Catholic Theological Faculty of Ruhr University Bochum and an associate member of the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford. His research includes theoretical, practical, and historical philosophy, and can be divided into three main areas, philosophy of science, metaphysics, transhumanism, ethics of digitization, and German idealism, and in particular, the philosophy of Karl Christian Friedrich Krause. He is the author of the book Pantheism, uh, The Pantheism of Karl Christian Frederick Krause from Transcendental Philosophy to Metaphysics from Peter Lang, GmbH, International Fairlag, Wissenschaft, first edition. Um, so I'm extremely excited to have you here. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Gurkha. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, for having me. <laughs> well, so part of the part of the series is to kind of um flesh out the history of 18th and 19th century German philosophy, classical German philosophy and German idealism, but also part of the series is to bring maybe minor figures, now I, I use minor loosely here because they're not minor, just maybe figures that are not well known to the more general audience of this tradition. So this is why you're here today to talk about uh, Karl Christian Frederick Krause. Um, so I was just wondering, perhaps, um, if you could begin by telling us who is Karl Christian Friedrich Krause, what was his importance um, and role in the history of German idealism, and why do you think we should return to um, Krause's philosophy uh, today? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Karl Christian Friedrich Krause was born uh, in May uh, 1781 and died uh, in September 1832. Um, he studied at the University of, of Jena from 1797 to 1804 when he left it as a, a habilitated and a promoted philosopher and mathematician. Um, so who was Karl Christian Friedrich Krause? I mean, he was um, certainly one of those figures in, in, in classical German philosophy who tried um, for his whole life to to build the, the one system of, of of philosophy, as in a way they they more or less uh, all try to do, and he um, did so based on the on the idea that um, a system of philosophy can only be basically a panentheistic system of philosophy. So. Um, Throughout all his publications, and he has like 256 publications, uh, and most of it is still uh, not edited at all and not even published in critical editions and, and not really available to the public because it is a, in, in the state library in, in uh, Saxonia, um, still waiting to, to be discovered. So in, in all of his philosophy, he tried to develop this system uh, and to justify that human beings actually are able to obtain what, what we could call the vision of the absolute or the vision of, of God, uh, which, and he preferred the term vision uh, to the term intellectual intuition, but more or less it, it, it's what he meant. Um, and based on this, he tried to develop a, a practical philosophy. Uh, it's, well, he wouldn't have said an utopian ideal, but it is a, a cosmopolitan vision for the whole of humanity and for the whole of life. So in a way, Krause worked on this idea that first we have to engage in theoretical philosophy and we have to, to lead ourselves to the uh, vision of the absolute. And based on that, we can deduce, so to speak, uh, the, the ideal political structure, which is a cosmopolitan structure uh, for the whole of humanity. And, and he uh, would have argued, but he argued that um, the only purpose of humanity is to, to realize this uh, league of humanity, as he called it, in, in German, Menschheitbund. Um, so th this is basically the, the, the key idea of his 
philosophy and um well in his life he well he had quite a, a turbulent life so he didn't stay uh, long at one particular place so from jena he left and uh, went uh, to dresden uh trying to obtain a permanent position in philosophy and then uh, that didn't work out in dresden then he moved to to berlin and uh, because he was one of, of fichte's well, most able students, he somehow hoped in 1813, 1814 uh, to, to become Fichte's successor in Berlin, but that didn't work out either. And so he went back to Dresden, where he lived, uh, probably we'll talk about that later, together with, with Arthur Schopenhauer in, in the same house. Um, and since he couldn't find a permanent position there, he went uh, to Göttingen, was unhappy there. And then finally, he, he went uh, to Munich, um, where apparently a shelling uh, well worked against Krause, so that Krause had uh, basically to leave Munich. But before that could have happened, he he died. Uh, so probably he had, he had a stroke. We we don't know. And he left uh, behind his his fourteen kids and and his wife, um, and at a massive philosophical uh, oeuvre, which uh, is still waiting to be discovered. Probably I did I. Yeah. No, I think I think that was very well succinct. I think that was an excellent answer. And I'm I'm sorry to hear that that Schelling was a was a gatekeeper, I guess, at that uh, time in Munich. Yeah, I mean I mean they seem to have had a well not a very good relation. At at one point Schelling in was Krause's uh, uh, teacher in, in Jena. And um Krause also wrote a lot of letters to, to Schelling. Uh, complaining that a uh, Schelling system is not logical enough and that Schelling apparently doesn't understand mathematics uh, and, and logic to a sufficient degree. And well, probably Sch Schelling didn't, didn't like that. Uh, and so uh, you can, if you look at Krause's letters, well, see that uh, there's a certain tension b between the both of them <laughs> for, for their whole life. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, actually, fun fact, Franz uh, von Bader, um, basically talked to, to King Ludwig in, in Munich and uh, persuaded him to to lift the the expulsion uh, order for Krause. Yeah. So Franz von Bader liked liked Krause. Yeah. Oh that's that's awesome. And and von Bader was a huge influence on both Hegel and Schelling and many other people as well too. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering you've done such a great job of of kind of introducing um Krause to us. Um, why do you think we should read his philosophy today? Why do you think his thought is important? Um, in your text, you 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 outline this idea that he has a an interest in the philosophy of mind for people that are interested in philosophy of mind. He's got a, a kind of philosophy of science as well. Um, what do you think that are reasons why we all should return to his thought today? I mean, the the main reason. Well, probably has to do with also my perspective on philosophy, that philosophy somehow still should try to to develop a kind of system of philosophy or should try to work on a on an all including worldview, on an all including perspective on on reality. Um on the one end and on the other, philosophy should also um have an impact on our daily life and on how we structure our society and um, should also in this respect uh, clarify the the ideals according to which we we want to live and well as as individuals and as a as a society and um krause what in a way in a system it achieves both so he has a very modern system of philosophy actually particularly his um his ethical uh writings and his philosophy of law it's really really up up to date um and must have looked uh, terribly modern uh in uh in in jena and, and dresden uh, back in the days um so i think what makes krause so interesting for me is that he actually worked on the system which i would say more or less is still a defendable system today and is such that we can still learn a lot from it if we agree that philosophy should provide this this all-encompassing 
system which which gives a or which answers the deep questions of of humanity like where are we coming from what's the purpose of it all where are we going and and he does so in a way well which is based um well not on some kind of of of, of religious revelation in particular but well in the tradition of the enlightenment which is just developed out of out of reason basically um yeah i mean i mean for instance he was um actually one of the first um philosophers who uh who argued explicitly for the absolute equality of of, of men and uh, women and of all human beings what whatsoever and um wait maybe i have a and also for the for for the rights of animals and also for the rights of of nature so particularly if we look today at, at the ecological crisis we have um we um can find in krause i'm sorry i'm just looking for my uh quotations um we have in krause an author who who still is more or less uh, on the level of our debates so for instance a german philosopher dieter birnbacher argued that um that krause actually was the one the first one who developed a systematic uh, animal ethics so this is quite um quite uh, quite interesting so taking all of these aspects um together i would say that uh Krause is not only interesting from a historical point of view, like, like a figure which also was somehow, well, in, in the Jena uh, circles involved, but which actually has something to say, which, um, which we can learn from. Yeah. And, and interesting, interestingly enough, I mean, particularly in Germany, the, the reception of Krause is also... Uh, very interesting because up until the beginning of of the 20th century figures like like nikolai hartmann uh said that well krause well they talked of a Schelling, fichte hegel and krause so hartmann said the big four of of german idealism um yeah let, let me just uh so uh for instance concerning the uh Equality of, of men and women, Krause said, um, uh, and I quote now, men and women are equally essential to humanity. So woman is in no way subordinate to man. In all her powers of spirit and heart and body, woman is just as capable and original as man in all parts of human destiny. And uh, in, in another publication, Krause uh, states, um, uh, the female sex is just as capable of all round, particular and consistent development as the male. And humanity itself remains only imperfectly and partially educated as long as the beautiful sex of women, ungratefully and unfeelingly oppressed by the brute strength of man, has to lag behind the male in some part of human determination. So uh, Krause was quite clear that uh, there is an absolute equality of men and women and also that there's an absolute equality of all men. I mean, as Krause says uh, at another uh, in another book, all people are equal. They are next to each other, not among each other. No one is subject to the other, but altogether they obey the law of God in moral freedom. Also dem Gesetze Gottes in sittlicher Freiheit. So and I think these aspects of, of Krause's philosophy and, and their really implications of his panentheism make him so interesting still um, for our discussions today. And if I'm not mistaken, well, cosmopolitanism is, well, a, a concept which is very much debated today and it should attract, uh, well. Everybody, all, it's a very big, it's a big, yes, it's a big issue. <laughs> It's a big issue, yes. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, in your opinion, if you if you had to, I know this is probably a hard question, who would you say are um, Krauss's philosophical influences and, and how did these philosophical influences inspire his own philosophy? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. I mean, well, Krauss also belonged to those... Um, who were quite fascinated from uh, the rediscovery of, of Indian philosophy. So in a way, the, the biggest influence probably on, 
on the whole mindset of 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 Krauss's panentheism is uh, the the panentheism of, of the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, and um, the the general philosophical outlook which we find in in the Vedic traditions. Um, I mean, Krause actually learned Sanskrit and um, had a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, which was published by uh, by Schlegel, um, and and he quite explicitly stated that. The, the beginning of, of, well, as he said, the beginning of human education is in India and the beginning of, of, of the scientific life um, of, uh, of humanity is in India. So he was quite clear that, well, coming to terms of the earliest root of uh, this development of humanity to recognize the truth of panentheism started um, in the old days in India. And he basically extracted uh, like four principles, uh, four philosophical principles, which he saw realized um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the Indian traditions. And, um, and the first principle, according to Krause, uh, is, is what I've called, well, the primacy of knowledge. So according to Krause, uh, and so is also his understanding of the Indian traditions, knowledge is a necessary condition for personal salvation and the prevention of evil. And now I quote from Krause, he says, the Indians recognize knowledge as the first foundation of all good, but ignorance as a first cause of all evil. They realize that without knowledge, the spirit cannot attain to true freedom, to pure selfhood, to the highest good. So based on this, Krause identified a second principle of, of Indian philosophy, which uh, can be called well, the primacy of God or the absolute. So it, it's not the Christian God, it's the absolute or the ultimate reality, probably is a, a better term. So uh, according to Krause, God is actually the, uh, the proper and ultimately the only object of knowledge. So as Krause says, now in relation again to the Indian philosophy, what is particularly remarkable, however, is the basic feature of ancient Indian education. The science, Vishnu, prevails in its entire life, and specifically pure science, the highest part of philosophical knowledge, which we commonly call metaphysics. According to the Indian system of science, science is the knowledge of God. So, and based on this again, uh, Krause also agreed with the Indian tradition that there's a primacy of existential transformation, which philosophy should be a part of, or which philosophy philosophy should uh, should work towards. Um, because there is, a, on Krause's uh, philosophy, a close connection between knowledge, spirituality, and the transformation of one's own existence. Uh, because to gain uh, knowledge of ultimate reality is itself a kind of prayer or, or meditation so that Krause could say, um, and now comes a, a longer quotation. Um, yes, it may be said, if it is correctly understood that scientific research and scientific observation is a prayer of the spirit, which is in itself contained in the call essence, God. Uh, it is evident, Krause goes on, from this, that the finite spirit researching science knows itself before God, in God, and always has God's infinite personality before its eyes. It is therefore absolutely certain that scientific research is a godly religious act called by ordinary names the worship of God in spirit and in truth. From this emerges the pure, profound, even genuinely scientific intrinsic religious sense of the fact that the Indian scientific researchers, philosophers and mathematicians, begin all their scientific works with unification, with a prayer. So, and based on this, so this is the final principle, uh, Krause could specify the, the proper goal of life, um, which he, well, in accordance somehow with, with many of the Indian traditions, um, Krause uh, clarified as becoming similar to God. Um, because Krause is quite clear, well, that the goal of life is to become similar to God. And uh, he gives an example concerning uh, the metaphysics of, of the word Aum. Or Om. Um, and he says, uh, the Vedas teach to pronounce the word, uh, the word Om with thought, 
with contemplation and mind and declare it to be profound and beautiful according to its individual sounds. This pronouncement is thus recommended by them as a part of becoming similar to God, which contributes to being constantly before God in spirit and mind and to keeping oneself present before God in God. For as the Vedas teach, he who knows God becomes God. I mean, in the Vedas is actually Brahman, but Krause translated that as, as God. So based on, on these four principles, which as said are the, the earliest roots of Krause's influence, he looks at the history of philosophy already from a very mon monistic, panentheistic point of view, and also, well, has a, has a great favor for, for instance, uh, 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 Augustine. So when, when Augustine says that, that God is more intimate to myself than I am, well, he, Krause would have agreed. But next to probably the Indian and uh, the, the early patristic traditions, it is actually Thomas Aquinas, who is uh, particularly in, 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 in Krause's uh, practical philosophy, he's the most prominent uh, influence. And then comes Immanuel Kant, obviously. So that Krause himself, he said at one point that in his system, he tries to, to combine this, this Indian monistic panentheistic tradition uh, with the, well, the, the, the scholar, scholastic philosophy of Thomas Aquinas of the high middle ages with Kant's transcendental um, philosophy into a, into a whole system uh, of, of philosophy, yeah. So he, he was uh, quite well read, actually. So he, he know a lot of sources, yeah. But if the question is, so what's the main influence? I would say it's the Indian philosophy, Thomas Aquinas and Immanuel Kant, yeah. That is, wow, what a what a fantastic answer and very well-rounded uh, thinker when we, um, yeah. when we think about this. Yeah, and, and actually I think in, I mean, he... But in a system, he, he really also is, is very much consistent. So whereas in, in, in other figures of the time, they, well, they have new approaches, they, they changed their system. Krause actually had this one idea, um, which he worked on his whole life. So basically in, in his system of philosophy, so from a methodological point of view, well, he has well, the, what he calls the analytic, the analytical ascending part of science, and the syn synthetical descending part of science. Um, and what well, he says, of course, we, 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 we can't ignore the lessons uh, uh, taught to us in the critique of pure reason. So he said, well, in a way, we have to start with, well, Krause probably would have rather said phenomenological or transcendental reflections on the ego and on the, on the constitution of the ego. And uh, well, Krause obviously doesn't agree doesn't agree with with Kant when Kant says that we can't uh, intuit God. I mean, Krause very much would have said, well, like many others, in uh, that, well, of course we can. We can through transcendental reflection, basically through an, uh, well, what, what Husserl later would have called like 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 the the epoche, or, or, or what a friend of mine, Stephen Priest in Oxford, calls uh, the fundamental epoche. Uh, discover that we have the idea um, of of the absolute always already within ourselves, and uh, that there is an act of of this intuition or of the vision of the absolute, which is um, itself immediately certain um, knowledge of the absolute. And once so, and once we are we have obtained that knowledge, so these reflections lead us up the way. So once we we have the intuition of the absolute, um, we can actually start working. Uh, on the deduction of the system of science. So we can then take what is seen, well, and here Krause is also a bit similar to, to the mystical traditions like uh, Bonaventure, um, uh, Meister Eckhart, and uh, Psydo the Dionysius, so in his mystical theology. So once we have obtained the, the vision of God, we, we can deduce a system of science, uh, but in such a way that in a way that, that there's a hermeneutical equilibrium. So, because nothing which was discovered on the analytical path may be rejected on the syn synthetical path. And if we see that there's a mismatch, uh, we have in a way to start anew. And this was in a way Krause's attempt to, well, to, 
to deal with, with a possible objection that uh, it's all just empty concepts which we are dealing with when we deduce a system. So because uh, it was quite important to Krause that it's all based on, on the life of, of the human beings and on what is phenomenologically available to that um, human being. Well, thank you very much for that. That was a fantastic answer. Um, I find it really fascinating in your book that, uh, as you state, that Krause and his family at one point lived with Arthur Schopenhauer. And I was wondering, what do you think their relationship was like? And, and do you think they, they ever influenced each other? Or maybe perhaps were they philosophical interlocutors at one point? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we we know that uh, what Schopenhauer already used to live in that house but when Krause and his back then, I think nine or eight kids moved in. Um, so probably the house was a bit more alive uh, when Krause and his family moved in. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I mean, when I think of Schopenhauer, I always consider him to be a, a kind of a bit grumpy. <laughs> I don't know what. So, but 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 we know, and and that was the reason why Krause moved into that house is that the the Royal Library, uh, the Japanische Palais, was was very close by and had an excellent uh, stock of Indian uh, books. So it is a uh, quite likely likely that uh, Krause and Schopenhauer actually met quite often uh, in the library. Um, and we know also that uh, Schopenhauer visited um, Krause's private lectures, which he delivered to his kids, um, and that um, Schopenhauer actually um, uh, had a lot of discussions with Krause um, to, to that degree that, that Krause actually in uh, 1821 complained uh, that the ideas which Schopenhauer published in the world as, as a will and representation, actually have been told Schopenhauer by, by him, by, by Krause. So, uh, and, and if we look at Schopenhauer's, well, Opus Magnum, and if we know what, what Krause was teaching in his lectures in, in, in Berlin in 1813, um, it, it's not, well, it's, it's, it's not hard to see it a very close connection on a very deep level of um, doing metaphysics, of, of, of engaging in, in, in philosophy. Um, I mean, they both very much said the same on the principle of, of sufficient reason, that there are different meanings uh, of it. Um, and um, it, in a way, well, now coming back to the Indian philosophy, which they both liked, I mean, Schopenhauer goes more in, into this Buddhist direction, at least for, for, for a certain point in his life. So he, you could rather, rather classify him as a Buddhist, and uh, uh, Krause rejected these ideas, so and he was more like the traditional Ad Advaita Vedanta guy. I mean, it, it's also not, but if we want to have the, these coarse-grained classifications, and it's quite interesting to see um, that the difference between them, in a way, is a difference, uh, well, between the conception of ultimate reality, which we find in, in Buddhism or in certain Buddhist traditions and in certain Indian traditions. Um, and in, 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 the, in, in the second edition of, of the world as Buddha and representation, um, I think Schopenhauer actually changed a bit of how he talks about ultimate reality or, or the will. So because he says, well, maybe the will has other properties which we don't know of, which we can't grasp. Um, and Krause would have said, yeah, sure, it, it has way more. And, and we actually can grasp them. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but I think that there is a huge influence of, of Krause on, on Schopenhauer. I mean, also particularly given that that, that Krause uh, was able to speak and, and read or to read Sanskrit and, and Schopenhauer apparently, well, at least to my knowledge, uh, wasn't. So, um, yeah, but, but, but then Schopenhauer uh, moved away to another flat um, and Krause also left uh, left Dresden to, to go to Göttingen. But I think there is quite a huge influence on Schopenhauer. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, you didn't ask for this, but there's also a, a line between Krause and, and Friege, which is quite interesting. Um, because uh, in, in Göttingen in uh, 18... 23, 24, 
Krause was talking about um, uh, Begriffsschrift, basically, so about uh, the pasigraphic tradition and uh, was picking up this, this Leibnizian idea of, of a universal symbolic language. And uh, one of his students back then was uh, Ford Lage, so professor who later was one of those who, uh, well, helped Frege to become, uh, to, to get his, uh, his extraordinary uh, professorship. And if you look at, at Frege's Begriffsschrift, so this, yeah, you, you know, the, the Begriffsschrift, and if you look at, at uh, Krause's logical notation, they are, they are quite similar, so that uh, another colleague uh, in Germany once said that, that this whole tradition, this whole uh, genar tradition of this pasigraphic uh, philosophical logical approach actually originated in, in Krause. Yeah. 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 Wow. I mean, even, even, yeah, yeah. even another colleague of mine, uh, Uwe Meixner, said uh, he has a paper in, in the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion uh, that, that the, the so called Venn diagrams, well, that could also have been called Krause diagrams because Krause has also the first combinatorical treatment of, um, well, of, of syllogistics, more or less. Yeah. So, but that just, uh, yeah, as an that's additional amazing. answer to, to a question not asked. <laughs> yes. No, no, that's great. That's great. Please, please uh, give as much as you'd like to, to tell. So, um, my next question it seems as if, as we touched on, that pantheism is an extremely important part of Krauss's philosophy. So, yeah. what is panentheism to Krauss, and how does panentheism connect with his entire system of philosophy? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, I mean, Krause is the one who introduced the 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 word panentheism. So sometimes it is argued that it was Schelling in 1809, but um, for instance, Philip Clayton argues for this, but I I think that is not true because I did not find it in, in Schelling. And Krause quite explicitly in, in 1828 in his lectures on the system of philosophy said, well, this is panentheism. So he said, science, Wissenschaft is panentheism. So, and the idea is that there is no, um, no strict ontological separation between empirical reality and the ultimate ground of empirical reality. So that in a way, uh, the world is part of the divine being itself or of the absolute. I mean, it's always a bit, well, technically it's the absolute and the absolute is divine, but Krauss is, as said explicit, explicitly, not, not talking so much about the Christian God or any any uh, conception of God um, to be found in, in, in revealed uh, religions. Um, and Krause, Krause's main argument for panentheism, well, is this um, idea which we also find uh, in, in Hegel, that, that if, if the absolute is truly infinite and truly unconditioned, well, then the world has to be included in this infinite and unconditioned being, uh, because if it was in any way outside, so in an ontological or an epistemological way even, um, it would have prevent the infinity and unconditionality of the absolute. Um, and speaking of the absolute, so of, of that which we see in the vision of the absolute, which more or less is understanding of this term unconditioned and uh, infinite being. Um, so once we understand that, we can see that the unconditioned and infinite being is in fact the, the one self same being. So the, the, the whole, because Krause argues that, well, the, the, the term infinite is, is a double negation. So, um, and it just means um, not being not uh, limited, not being not limited. Yeah, so that the infinite, the infinite being, it's is the whole being. Yeah, okay. I think I, I got something not quite right a few seconds ago, but uh, the infinite being is the whole being, and the unconditioned being is the only free being. So that the absolute, or to say that the absolute is unconditioned, 
And infinite just means that it is the whole and the free self same being. And the world is just a part of this being. So which led Krause um, uh, to develop, well, which what, what maybe can be called one of the first meriological mir approaches to panentheism. So because he said, well, so if, if that is true, so if the absolute is the one infinite and unconditioned being, and if the world, which is the realm of all finite, is somewhat included there, so then that means that we can talk about ultimate reality and empirical reality uh, in a way we talk about an organic whole and its parts. So, and then he introduces different perspectives on how we can speak of a whole in relation to its parts, um, which gives Krause a, a whole range of, well, Krause introduced a whole range of new terms, um, like, like Orwesen, uh, or or essence, or Ohm Wesen, uh, or Ohm essence male Wesen, and, and stuff, and he was actually quite ridiculed uh, for doing that. And, and the problem why Krause probably didn't get the, whatever the recognition he, he would have deserved is that he actually uh, tried to develop his system of philosophy, at least in later years, in such a way that the terms he used are not Latin terms, not no 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 Greek terms, no English, no French, but uh, pure logical terms uh, with a lot of prefixes also, um, and that is actually quite quite hard to read. Um, but if you if you invest a bit of time, uh, you can see that it actually makes sense. So at the first impression when I for the first time, read Krause, I thought to myself, "Oh my God, uh, <laughs> what what is this?" <laughs> um, but but if you but if you're patient enough uh, and actually let Krause talk to you, then um, you see that there, there's a whole fascinating meriology, um, which we can use to talk about ultimate reality slash God slash the absolute and um, empirical reality slash created reality, contingent reality. When you, when you bring up the term vision, um, I'm now interested. Does he mean vision in a, in a, in a Kuzanian sense, like a vision in God or, or the, 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 the kind of, uh, I don't want to say mystical, I don't want to confuse him as a mystical thinker, but this kind of mystical insight, you know, the eye in which I see God is the eye that God sees I. Like the Meister Eckhart, Mr. the Meister Eckhart, sorry, yeah. um, vision in that sense. Um, difficult to say. Um, difficult to say. Yes and no. Um, I mean, in a way, Krause highly appreciated the, the mystical traditions like the, the the contemplative approaches to to theological questions where in a way um also through certain kinds of meditations uh, you climb a ladder the and then come as close to to the essence of of God as, as possible for finite minds like like us um well he, he would have said yeah that's probably possible and he would have taken that then a bit further to say that in this vision, we see a lot about the basic structure of reality. Um, because uh, we know that uh, finite reality, because it is a part of the absolute, has to share in its categorical determinations uh, in the nature of the categorical determination of the absolute, uh, which means because the absolute is the one paradigmatic self, same and whole being, every finite entity also is a self, same being. So he derives his whole uh, table of categories uh, um, out of the vision from the absolute. I mean, he's just not he's not just saying this is the case. He's saying, well, I mean, this also makes sense, um, what I'm telling you. 
because he also agreed that um that of course all all the the Kantian categories are arbitrary nonsense. But now I tell you the 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 proper categories. <laughs> I mean, um, but I think they're, they're good categories. Um, but the terms for them are also a bit. You have to get used to them, like selfhood, um, uh, directedness. Um, in a way, he says, well, every entity. Well, probably today we would say is, is self-identical, is directed upon itself, um, covers itself completely uh, and has an internal structure which is in relation with, with its uh, intrinsic and ex or which constitutes its intrinsic nature and therefore also its extrinsic nature. So today we would use a bit different terms, but... Um, so coming back to your questions, uh, to a question, well, yeah, he, he would have said, well, this is what in the mystical tradition also was aimed at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, Thank you. Um, um, he's but talking about, uh, the, so, so he's talking about vision and not um, intuition because, I mean, he has a reason for doing so. Um, because he says, well, if we call it, so in, in German, Anschauung. He says, uh, Anschauung isn't as good as Schau, so which I translated now in, in this talk as vision. Um, so because he says, intuition is not so good to use here as vision, because when intuit intuiting, one thinks of a contrary relatedness of the external relation between the one who looks and what is seen. But this is not uh, consistently the case. For example, in the vision of the absolute, there is no external relation, but only an internal relation. So uh, when you said, well, would Krause say the eyes that sees is the eyes that, um, yeah. So Krause would have said, yes, ultimately, the, the only subject of, of recognition or of knowledge is God, because ultimately, uh, and here Krause is, is also thinking in the direction in, in which uh, 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 Jonathan Schaffer is thinking with his priority monism and all these debates. I mean, Krause would have said, well, there's a priority of the whole, of course, which is the absolute. Um, and ultimately, since we are all parts of the absolute, um, if we break it down to what really happens, it is God knows God, God as something knows God as, as, a, as another, in another um, dimension. Yeah. Which is then what Krause relates back to the Indian traditions. Yeah. Wow. That, I can, I can see what you mean by um, yeah, yeah. systematic and complex. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you had brought up the, the concept of the Orvesen or the Omvesen. I was wondering um, that with the concept of the Orvesen, it seems to yeah. be one of his most distinguishing concepts from what I've read um, of your text. I was yeah. just wondering if you could elaborate how maybe how Krauss came up with this idea and, and what he uses the Orvesen in his philosophy for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you pause for a second until I find a... So we were talking about the the concept of the Orvesen and, and its and its relation to like how he came up with it and and how it's used in in Krauss's philosophy. Yeah, right. So as I said, uh, Krause has this idea of panentheism, which means that everything finite is contained, included, is in uh, um, the absolute, or or in God, as he also called the absolute. And so based on this idea, Krause um, felt the challenge um, that he had to clarify based on this, what it means to say that the world is out of God or that God and the world are distinct, while at the same time, well, the world and God are not distinct, but the world is very much included in the absolute. And so he based this idea of considering the whole of reality, or, or he he spelled out this idea of considering the whole of reality as an organic whole. And then Krause said, well, um, let's introduce some prefixes. 
um, which, by the way, Krause related back to, to Sanskrit. Um, at times and at times uh, on the way human beings pronounce certain sounds. So he had probably the, the three well prefixes which concern our question now is like um, or, like okay. or, uh, ur, which often is translated as original, like ur something. Yeah. And um, uh, om, actually, like the, the Indian uh, sound, om. Um, and he said, well, or, or has a certain ring of, a certain wholeness to it as a sound. So at one point, he also describes how the sound is generated in the human body. And he said, it is a, a, a sound, um, well, in a way, De denoting well the the infinite harmony Let, let's let's say it like this and he said so if we if we consider th this organic whole or if we consider the absolute um without thinking of its um internal parts then we can call God or the absolute or essence. So essence is always for the German Wesen. So if we think, if we consider the whole without recourse to its parts, if we consider God as this one infinite unconditioned whole, then then I then I will refer to the absolute as, as or essence, like or um, Wesen. Um, so all essence is the thought of the one infinite and unconditioned being together with its parts or and their relations outside of which there's nothing. So I, I do not think of the parts explicitly. I just think of the whole. And he says, but this is not the only way I can think about the relation between a whole and its parts. I can also think of um, a whole. Um, no, I can also think only of the parts of a whole and their relations. And Krause would have called that Ohm essence. So if I think basically of the internal structure of the absolute, I think of what Krause would have called Ohm essence. And he says, well, I call it Ohm essence because Ohm in Indian philosophy designates the unity of unity and difference. So the unity of the unity and difference of all the finite parts and their relations. And um, Krause said that finally, um, I can think also of a whole as having metaphysical priority over its parts or as having logical priority over its parts. And if I do that, I think of the absolute as ur essence or as original essence. So, um, so as Krause says, God is also ur essence. That is God as a whole being is prior to and over and above or that God is in himself. So, um, in a way, we have here three, well, quite unusual terms. <laughs> I think that that's that's to be granted <laughs> um, at hand with which we can express the relation a whole can have to its parts. So I can think of the whole, like including its parts, but not explicitly mentioning them. Then I think of the absolute as the absolute, outside of which is nothing. If I think of the whole in so far as it has logical or metaphysical priority over its parts, then I think of God as uh, ur essence. And if I think just of the realm of finitude and, and its relations, then I think of the absolute and so far as it is in, well, himself, itself, I don't know what the right is, um, being this uh, totality of relations. So and based on this, um, well, it, it is a metaphysical myriology. Um, based on this, Krause was quite happy to be able to solve um, uh, what he understood as one of the, the haunting issues of his time. So whether God is, is outside of the world or whether the, the world itself is divine. So this atheism, pantheism struggles, uh, which, which, which they all had. And he said, well... Um, <clears throat> Uh, he said, uh, wait, 
So and and based on um, the distinction between the absolute considered as or essence and the absolute considered as ur essence, Krause was able to solve this problem concerning how God and the world are related. I mean, Krause says um, in his system of philosophy, uh, I quote, through this, so the just mentioned distinction, therefore is proven the fundamentally important distinction between the following two propositions. The world is outside of God and the world is outside of God as ur essence. The first sentence is fundamentally false because apart from or essence, nothing is conceivable in that the infinity and unconditionality of God would be denied by the slightest external appearance. But the other sentence, that the world is outside of and under God, in so far as God is ur essence, states the fundamental essential property of God. So he says, well, it depends on how we look at the absolute and the world. If we look at the absolute as or reason, as or essence, so as is infinite and unconditioned being, then of course the, the world is in God and God is not separated from the world. But if we think, so to speak, of the whole as having logical property over its uh, priority over its parts, then, of course, we have a distinction between God, as the whole, which has logical metaphysical priority, and the parts, which are grounded in, uh, in the whole. So, and, and Krause was quite happy that uh, he found a way between pantheism and, uh, well, theism, personal theism, probably. Or, well, I'm not sure whether classical theism is so far away from panentheism, but... Um, for Krause, it was a real achievement to be able to have this distinction um, between the ways that we think about the world in relation to its ultimate ground. Yeah. You had also mentioned that you you had a graph you wanted to show or a, or, or a, a picture, if, you, if you'd like. Right. You... Yeah, right, yeah. That would be fascinating. If you... Oh, perfect. We can definitely see that. That's amazing. So if you... You, you see the O, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes, absolutely. So that's, that's the, the largest circle. And that is the absolute, considered as or essence, um, as the one infinite and unconditioned being. And everything else is now part, now there the are two features. The, the circle denoted by the uh, U uh, is the absolute considered as uh, ur essence, so as the absolute ground um, of its parts, and the circles E and I can read it from here E uh, basically are nature and spirit, which constitute together the realm of uh, the world, the realm of finite, and the overlapping section, but probably we will talk about this, is humanity. Uh, yeah, so that in this diagram, well, which friends of syllogistics were. were well, no, uh, the whole metaphysics of, of Krause uh, is um, symbolically contained, yeah. And, and I actually think it's, 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 it's true. It's, I think this is really one of the best metaphysical theories we, we have when it comes to the relation between the world and its ultimate um, ground. Okay, so going along those lines, uh, I was wondering if if we could maybe bring in to the picture where nature and humanity fit into this picture. Yeah, which brings us back to the beginning of the analytical ascending part of philosophy. Um, Krause starts basically by picking up a, the the human being in the all dailiness of his existence. So in a way, as a pre-reflective ego, he says, well, here, here I am. And um, if I think uh, of myself, so if I start reflecting uh, on what kind of being I am, Krause says, well, there are different senses uh, in which we use the term I. Um, but he says, well, it is quite, quite undeniable that uh, apparently we, we have a body 
um, and we we have a mind or spirit. And he says, yeah, uh, I have a body and uh, I, I am a mind or I have a mind. But I am not only a body and I'm not only a mind. So Krause says, um, I am yet already the, the union of spirit and nature. So the, the union of, of mind and body. Um, and he said, uh, well, if we take that as a starting point, for reflection that I am a being which yet already is uh, the union of nature and spirit. Uh, and if we think that further, well, then I can see that, uh, well, my body uh, as being part of nature is only thinkable. So if I suppose uh, that my body is part of, or that there is nature of which my body is part, even in such a way that many things of my body I can't control. I mean, whatever my, the, the functions, the bio, today we would call the, say the biochemical functions of my body are just out of my control um, to a large degree. And he says, well, so there is nature. So I have the, the conception of nature uh, as this infinite um, uh, realm of, uh, phenomena which is structured by the principle of sufficient reason as that's from Grunde basically so because the appearances uh, which I have just lead to this picture just I'm, I'm skipping now a lot but uh, in a nutshell this is his idea and on the other hand spirit uh, well I'm not the whole spirit myself so I'm participating in a realm of spirit there are other human beings there's reason there are truths which the which can just be grasped by assuming that there is a realm of spirit. And he says, well, um, so there is nature, there is spirit. Human beings are the union of nature and spirit. And he says, well, is there anything finite which cannot be uh, uh, subordinated either to nature or spirit well, or their union in humanity? And he says, well, no, there, there's nothing finite which isn't either a part of nature or a part of spirit, or a part of um, humanity. And so he says, but the world, our conception of the world, is just what we mean by everything finite. And so he says, the realm of, of finitude is constituted by nature, ultimately by nature and reason. Um, and nature and reason, um, in a way, uh, are such that the one is in the other. So, I mean, this idea that that nature is in reason through the laws of nature, which we can recognize. And uh, spirit uh, is in nature, well, because it is, it proceeds according to, to the laws of nature, which are reasonable. Um, and so he sees this union and overlapping between uh, the different realms of, um, of finite reality and he then goes on to argue, well, but but how is this possible that nature and um, or how is my my very own existence possible as being an, an instance of this union of nature and spirit? And he says, well, well, Fichte, sorry, but but the eye itself can't can't do it. So because the eye itself is 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 finite, and so he says, well, but there has to be. Well, now using a different sense of the uh, principle of sufficient reason, there has to be a ground um, which is responsible for this union of nature and reason, which we phenomenologically uh, find it as existing, well, in, in each of us. Um, and then he says, well, because the question for the ground or reason for the union of nature and spirit um, is in effect the question for the ground of finitude because well nature and uh, reason they themselves according to Krause are also finite because the one is not what, what the other is so there's a exclusion in a way and union uh, the reason for this union can only be the infinite being itself so the the absolute itself so he says this idea of God considered as the infinite and uh, unconditioned principle is yet already always in us. And the 
the principle of sufficient reason, what itself, and this is another kind of clue, is, is a finite thing. So Krause says it has to be applied to itself. So that Krause uh, can say, well, God or the absolute is also the ground of the ground of the principle of sufficient reason, or the reason for the reason why the principle of sufficient reason is valid at all. Um, so that there is also another circle closed, so to speak. So he starts with reflections on the eye. Well, I'm, I'm body, I'm, I'm mind, realm of nature, realm of spirit. They are yet already united. Um, what can be the reason? Well, only the infinite itself. Um, yeah, and, and I think that is also why um, why he, he was so happy with Indian philosophy and uh, probably Hegel wasn't so much happy with, uh, with Indian philosophy because in Krause there is the, the historical process isn't needed to somehow I don't know uh, uh, I don't know the English. Self-actualize? Yeah, the, the, the relation. So spirit doesn't need nature to to, uh, to get over nature. So that it is already done, basically, from all of eternity because it is part of the internal structure of the, the unity. So there's not much development uh, in the realm of, um, of history concerning these, uh, concerning the relation between nature and spirit. It always was united and nature is um, of the same words as a spirit. So this is also another speciality in Krause's thinking because he says, well, uh, nature and spirit, uh, they are just on an equal scale. So it's not the case that spirit somehow is better than, than nature. Um, so which is why on Krause's ecological well, conclusions, he says, well, nature is as uh, intrinsically valuable as a spirit, which is why we have to take care of nature. And he says, well, it, it would be a crime almost to think that nature is something which somehow is inferior to spirit. He says, no, it, it's it's on the same scale of, of ontological uh, value. And in fact, it is part, well, it, it is in fact, nature is one aspect of the divine being as important as spirit. So what, what, yeah, why, of course, nature is to be protected. I think the term maybe was Aufhebung, sublation. Maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess my last question to you is uh, how did you get introduced to uh, Krauss's philosophy? And um, why, why, why did it draw you in so much? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good, good question. It's one of those. Um, contingent events uh, which happened in life. So my, my, my supervisor for my uh, PhD in a way told me, look at Krause. So it was Klaus Müller who was a, a theologian at a Münster University and also uh, a panentheist. And he said, well, I, I've heard that there is this, this Krause who apparently introduced the term panentheism, but uh, uh, I don't know much more about this. Why don't you look into Krause? And I was quite attracted to the concept of panentheism uh, myself back then already, and so I thought, well, yeah, let's let's look into Krause, and um, it was a completely new, new world uh, actually, because he is well, as you said at the beginning, he he's hardly hardly known um, these days, at least at least not not in the 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 English uh, and German speaking communities. I mean, he he had, and he got he had a, a massive impact actually. Uh, worldwide, um, it may be, well, probably in the top five of the most influential German philosophers, if, if we look at Spain and Latin America, because uh, the, the, the Krausismo uh, basically is or, or was a movement which uh, up until the 19, uh, 1930s in, in Spain and in, in Argentina and, and Brazil, uh, Brazil uh, Apparently, what was extremely important and, and shaped uh, uh, whole debates and generations of, of scholars. Um, so that Krause at times uh, was considered to be the, the most important German philosopher. So Krause had an extreme influence on, on, on the Spanish culture and actually 
uh, some colleagues uh, in well in, in Spain argue that he 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 was the, the driving force behind a Spanish modernity and Latin American modernity, um, which is funny. So uh, there there are a lot of Spanish translations of uh, of Krause's writings, but uh, to my knowledge, there is not even one English translation of a whole book of Krause. I'm I'm, I'm working on one right now, um, but. Uh, in Germany and uh, in the English-speaking world, completely forgotten. Well, and yeah, what, what, what brings me to Kraus is, is actually that that I'm in the happy position to think that much of what he says is is, is probably true, <laughs> uh, and actually it, it's modern and it helps us, uh, yeah, to to be clear or it answers philosophical questions in quite a satisfying way. Although he's also demanding, as I said, I mean his style of writing is um demanding uh but when, you, great, right? yeah. when you finish the translation the english translation let me know and and we can pr we could do a video on it and promote the the book and that would I be will. amazing yeah 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 it, well, it will I, be a of uh, the human archetype so which is one of krause's best-selling books uh well at least back then uh it has five or six editions in uh in germany uh, and there he presents basically his ideas in a very accessible way. Uh, yeah, and he argues why cosmopolitanism is um, the way to go. Yeah, and you have a new a new book on on Krause yeah. coming out in English, correct? All right, it should be published. I think April next year. It's just a very short introduction published by Peter Lang. Um, and it's called, I think, Panentheism and Cosmopolitanism, a very short introduction to Krause. So, but, but I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming here and introducing us, and not just introducing us, going through such a complex system and taking us through Krause's life. And, and um, now that this video is, is going out there, maybe it'll attract more um, yeah, cool. interest yeah, into Krause, so. hopefully. So, um, Thank you again. And uh, thanks for having me again. <laughs> no, I am thanking you for being here. You were fantastic. And uh, I wish you the best. Yeah, the best for you too. And uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye. Right, take care. Bye bye.